It's December 2nd, 2009. We are in the Glenview Public Library. We are talking to Wayne Carley, born August 18th, 1951. Interviewers are Julia, Edson, Matt, and Phil with the Veterans Oral History Project. Mr. Carley served in the Marine Corps as a Master Gunnery Sergeant in the United States and in the Pacific. Were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. Why did you decide on that? Uh, better to enlist than be drafted. And at the time, even though it was in 71, there was still a draft. And the Army does not have the greatest track record in history. And so I decided that uh, to try for something uh, that had a, uh, a bit of history to it, which was the Marine Corps. So you picked the Marine Corps just based on not wanting to be in the Army and based on the history that you know of the Marine Corps? Uh, yeah, for the most part, the, the history about the Marine Corps and the traditions. And uh, the Navy didn't want me because of my big feet. So it was easier. Do you recall the first days of your service, either in training or in actual uh, Sure. Being deployed, Every, everybody remembers the first day of training. The uh, in Illinois, uh, being going to recruit training. Uh, every other group goes to San Diego. In other words, we have there's two recruit training centers for the Marine Corps. One is down at uh, Paris Island, South Carolina. The other one is uh, San Diego, California better known as Hollywood. Um, if you like uh, to be on, a, on a, uh, an island that has sand flies and uh, no chance of seeing anybody besides just Marines, then uh, that's great. Uh, if you like the idea of uh, being tortured by uh, watching the airplanes land at the airport in San Diego, then, then that's the way to go. But uh, it just happened that uh, the group that I was in went out to San Diego. And as they say, it's, uh, if you see the commercials, it's the yellow footprints on the, on the road. Drill instructor comes in to the bus, tells everybody to get off the bus on the footsteps. You get on the footsteps, it's always at night. I don't think I've ever seen a class during the day that, that comes in. Uh, and there's reasons for that, you know, all psychological. And then it's, uh, if you're lucky and then the uh, platoon is formed right away, um, you get start processing. If not, then you, in my case, I ended up uh, being held for uh, six hours in a room with uh, 50 other people that were that to keep us uh, busy. They had us doing push-ups and sit-ups and things of that nature until they had enough bodies in there to, to form a the series, and it was, uh, then, you, then you started processing, you know, you go in, get your hair cut, and down to nothing, so you don't have to worry about uh, hygiene, you know, and uh, then from there it's uh, getting the three, in, the three instructors, drill instructors, you have a senior drill instructor and two, uh, two assistants, and meeting them. And, uh, and going from there. What was your view of officers either in training or post-training? Officers, any, well, being a, a boot, anybody with any rank is a sir. Uh, once you're out of boot camp, you go into uh, your next phase of training which is infantry, infantry uh, training regiment. Uh, that's when you that's when you really get to, to see all different types of officers and all that. But you're still in the mindset that uh, any rank above you is God. Officers were just there, you know. Uh, each series in boot camp, each series had a, had an officer, and at graduation you saw the regimental commander. Otherwise, uh, the only time you saw any officers were for inspections. When you got to uh, the infantry training regiment, uh, 
you had officers for each platoon plus the company commander, so it was just like a regular rifle company. And so now you're dealing with a second lieutenant plus your, your staff NCOs that you had to deal with. But it was still with the mindset that anybody above you, it's very difficult to get out of that mindset that, that of calling them sir, even though you're not supposed to call them listen and sir. But because in boot camp, it's yes sir, no sir, aye aye sir, before, after, you know, so, and that's ingrained in you. Where specifically were you deployed outside of the United States? I spent a year on Okinawa, which at the time when I left, it was still part of, uh, under uh, United States control. Uh, and this was in uh, 1972. And when I, when I got there, um, at the time Marines were a single deployment. Um, you were there for a year unaccompanied. They had uh, accompanied tours for, uh, for certain staff NCOs and officers that could bring their wives. Otherwise you just, you were there. Uh, as, as bachelor, and uh, halfway through, they uh, we turned the island back over to the Japanese control. What was your exact job or assignment while you were at Okinawa? I basically went to Okinawa as a uh, engineer equipment mechanic. Uh, went down to the uh, maintenance battalion headquarters to report in. Uh, they asked if I could type. I made the mistake. I said yes. And I became a file clerk at the battalion headquarters for six months. Uh, at that at that time, uh, they changed the uh, the way the files were uh, were kept, and uh, they brought somebody in who was school trained, and then sent me back down to the mail room instead of sending me out to the uh, out to my my job, shall I say? Uh, so I ended up in the mail room for the last six months that I was there. So. Uh, did you ever see any combat or experience any battles? No. Are you relieved, discouraged, or what is your feeling towards not actually seeing combat? Um, the old saying of always a bridesmaid, never a bride. In, in the Marine Corps, everybody is a rifleman. You are trained from day one to be the tip of the sword, to be the meat eater. Um, that's the whole purpose of the Marine Corps, is to be that force and readiness to be deployed anywhere at any time, to make the beachhead, to uh, give time for the follow-on troops, the Army or whatever, to come in. So. Your mindset is always to be combat ready. Having said that, there's a lot of jobs that you have that aren't combat arms. You have support jobs. And those are still necessary, but it's not as mindset as being deployed type of thing. So it's, it's, um, it's a little hard to be that and not go in harm's way. Uh, when I was on Okinawa, we, we deployed uh, we, our battalion as part of the 3rd Marine Division, deployed uh, what we call floats off of the island to Vietnam and down the coasts of uh, Hong, you know, Hong Kong, Singapore, that type of thing. I volunteered nine times to go. Uh, every time I volunteered, I was told no because I was in the battalion headquarters. Had I worked down in the company headquarters, I would have gone. My roommate uh, worked in the company headquarters. He went. And uh, so, I mean, it's, it's hard to... Uh, relate to folks that you know that have gone into harm's way and you haven't. Even though you're the same age 
you've spent the same time, but not necessarily the same place. So, did you uh, enlist with anybody around the area that you lived with, or any friends from, let's say, high school or childhood no. friends? Did any of your friends, like your roommate, did any of them see combat? Did you talk to them after that? What kind of stories had you heard from people who were uh, in battle? Well, having done 24 years in, in the active and reserve community, I've, I've served with people who have been in harm's way. Uh, even when I got to Okinawa, the uh, operations chief was a uh, force recon marine who had just come back from uh, from Vietnam. Uh, when I got out of boot camp, my first duty station was at uh, first shore party at uh, Camp Pendleton, and my my job was to clean off the equipment that had just come back from Vietnam with the guys from the first shore party. So yeah, there was there was folks in my in the, the new company that I joined that were just waiting discharge. Um, it's hard if you if you haven't been if you if you're not going, it's very hard to relate to what they they've been. You can listen to all the stories. Um, you can talk to them. A lot of them don't talk about what they've done. I spent uh, three years with a uh, Force Recon Marine in the reserves out in uh, South Weymouth on active duty with them. And uh, I've seen pictures, but we've spent a lot of time together, but he would never discuss because I wasn't there. So it's, it's you can't relate to what they've gone through. So it's, it's, and that's any era that you go to. You can listen to them talk about all the hardships, the rain, the mud, the, you know, constant shelling or the constant, you know, or the, uh, the five seconds of sheer terror and the 15 days of boredom of waiting for that, you know. It's, it's all, all of that. Were you awarded any medals or citations during your service? Are there any that stand out or mean a uh, lot to you? Bas basically, what I have are, are just the, uh, the service awards. Uh, of course, we, the unit, uh, when we were in Okinawa, because we did the nine floats, we were awarded the uh, Navy uh, Meritorious Unit Citation for supplying that. And that's a, that's a unit citation, so everybody that was in the unit was given a an award. Uh, otherwise, uh, I have just the, uh, the good conduct for both uh, active duty, the reserve, and the armed forces reserve. So it just meant that I was a good guy for 23 out of 24 years. Uh, during your service, was it easy to stay in touch with your family or stay in touch with those still at home? Oh yeah. Um, you have to remember, I went in before we got into the, you know, when we talk computers, you're talking a room for a computer and digital cards. So we didn't have all of what, you know, we had, uh, you, you did a lot of letter writing. And of course in boot camp, every, uh, you were required to write a letter once a week to home. Um, but, uh, and then you can make phone calls after you had, you had uh, in the third phase, you could make phone call. Once you got out and then got to your first duty station or after you go through boot camp and then you go through training, then you go through your MOS training, which is uh, learning the job that you're gonna be assigned to. And that's, then you get into the normal 7.30 to, to 4.30. Evenings are, are basically free except for one night a week where you have to do the field day uh, or else a duty section. So it, it gets into being that, that job of 7.30 to 4.30 and in time. So, What was the time that you felt the most pressure or was the most stressful for you? Uh, each time that you're put on alert. Um, when I was 
uh, with Shore Party. We were uh, we were put on alert for uh, the, the games that the Arabs and the Israelis were playing at the time. So that's 24 hours on of, of constant being ready to, at the moment's notice, get on the plane and go. Uh, did that then uh, in, uh, in Okinawa was uh, during the typhoons season where you got to uh, be on, on call, on duty for uh, making sure that all the gear was tied down and what have you and, and racing around. That was, that was fun yet stressful when you're out in a typhoon in the back of a truck with a helmet and your goggles on and it's coming down and you're raining and you know you got uh, uh, you lose all the power for three days and you're living out of uh, MREs or sea rats and barrels of water and uh, you got barrels of water so you can flush the toilets and that type of thing. Um, that's that's you know, but uh, it's. Otherwise, when you get to a regular, you get back to the duty stations again, it's just getting the job done within the time frame that you have. How did people entertain themselves while they were at, uh, in the service? You had uh, organized sports. We had uh, most, most of the major installations. You have uh, base theaters. You have your... Uh, your PXs or your, your your exchanges, your stores. You could go out in town when you had liberty. Um, if you were fortunate enough and had a car, and you, you could you know disappear into town. So it's just, it's just like any other any other time. Uh, there was a lot of changes from the time that I went in to the time that. Uh, I got off of active duty in the three years, from 71 to 74. You went from having to wear a uniform out in town to being able to wear civilian clothes out in town, uh, to being, you know, where you could go, where you couldn't go. You had 72-hour uh, uh, passes or 24-hour passes or whatever, to being unlimited. Uh, as long as you were, didn't have to work on a weekend, you were off that weekend, you know, things of that nature. Was there a big difference in perception when you went out in civilian clothes and when you went out in dress uniform? With the Marine Corps, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to hide the fact that you're a Marine because you're a haircut. Uh, most Marines have what we call high and tights, which means that there's very little on the sides and just a, you know, a, half, a flat top or half an inch on the top. Uh, it's just that's part of the persona of being the Marine. If you go to the Euro wing, it's a little different. You can have from from zero to three inches. So it's evenly graduated with three inches of being the length of hair. Um, but you can always tell service people when you're on town. I mean, you can put them in t-shirts and, and whatever, but. The, in most cases, it's the mannerisms besides the haircut that stand you apart. And it's your carriage and how you carry yourself. And that just comes from whether you're in for just one tour of three years or four years now, or whether you're in for longer. It's just a, uh, a sense of change in your appearance, in your, you know, your carriage, the whole thing. You mentioned um, going out into town. Were you able to go out into the town when you were out of the United States? And what was that like to see a different life or a different culture that we're not accustomed to in the United States? Uh, being over in, in Okinawa, um, I believe the island is eight miles long four miles wide. They had an east-west store in uh, Kadena, which you get up on the roof, you could see the, uh, the Sea of Japan and the Pacific Ocean, depending on which way you look. You're dealing with uh, basically an island that has military installations on it. There's Navy, Navy at uh, Naha, 
you had uh, Air Force at Kadena, which was a large Air Force base. You had a lot of Marines at the north end of the island. You had Army at uh, Camp Buckner, which was right across from where I was stationed. So you had an awful lot of military with a small populace of civilians. And a lot of those folks worked for the military in warehouses or civilian jobs, and, or else they catered to the military if you were around in the towns. But you always try to learn something of their customs, their language, at least to say hello. You know, it's something that you, you know it, you you try to do. You know, and, and to you have to follow both sets of rules. You have a rule for the military, you have a civilian rule. So if you step over the line, you end up being picked up by the Okinawan police or the Japanese police. Well, your time in service stands still while you work that out, and then you have to make up the time when you get that. So it's, it's, and it's, so you have to learn the customs and, and that. And we had, uh, in, in Fatima, we had a school that uh, a couple of the guys that I worked with were adopted by some of the classes, and they'd spend a lot of time with them and that. So it was, you know, and, and getting to know people. I mean, yes, you could stay on base and not go off a of base and still, you know, have the theaters and the, the, the club system and everything else, but then you're narrowing your experience. So just what it is, it's what you as an individual wanted to do. You had mentioned that you went through many different battalions. Where Was it pretty much uniform how those were run or set up, or did you see changes between what battalions or what units you were in? Well, there's always rules and regulations from or directives from headquarters Marine Corps that tells you this is how everything's done. Then you get down to uh, interpretations of those by your company that you want. Well, you, you belong to a either a platoon, or you, you start with your squad, platoon, company. Then that company belongs to the battalion. That battalion belongs to the regiment. The regiment belongs to division so that when you're down working you're in whatever whatever job you are doing depends on what shop you go to so you get that group of folks and they have their rules and regulations and then you work for the company so you have a company formation and they run how you're living and then the battalion has rules and regulations of when the battalion gets together and, and then all the way up. So, and it just depends on what's set up by the officers in charge. Do you recall the day that your service ended? Active wise, reserve wise, or total? Both. <laughs> that and then why did you decide to join the reserve? Well, I spent uh, my, my tour was three years from 71 to 74. Um, at the time I had thought about re-enlisting but the, uh, the career planner and I didn't see exactly eye to eye and we dallied and dillied and my time came up where the morning I woke up and they, they called me to head up to the office and said here's your discharge papers have a nice day. So, packed all my stuff, got in the vehicle, and drove home. Got back here. I didn't really think about it uh, too much. Uh, I moved out to Boston for a uh, employment, and uh, the uh, officer candidate for uh, recruiters from Harvard. Put on a uh, on a show in uh, downtown Boston at the, at the Government Plaza. 
They brought the Marine Corps Drone Mule Corps up from uh, Albany, Georgia. And while I was there, uh, being former Marines, Marines always find Marines to talk to. And so I was uh, talking to the, uh, the officer who brought up the, uh, the band and he uh, found out that I was prior service and thought that uh, I might be interested in the reserves. And since there was a reserve unit out of, out of Boston, uh, I said, sure, why not? I'll talk to him. And the uh, next thing I knew, I was down at the armory uh, taking my physical, and uh, there I was in the reserves. So it was a continuation of being on, you know, with the Marine Corps. Did you keep any close friendships after you served either in the reserve or even after the reserve? I have a few that uh, we still get in touch with. Um, it's a little different uh, piecewise. You go with, especially at the Marine Corps, is, is uh, for my first three years, I was somewhere different every year. It wasn't until I got to my last duty station at Cherry Point that I found somebody that had actually been at the same place for two years. I always thought that you moved around every year. Um, so it was, you see people, you meet them, and, and everybody goes their own way. Uh, things happen where you, you send, you know, letters or whatever, but it, it still, when you're in combat with those same people for six months, a year, or shorter, but you're under the gun. You form a closer bond because it's, you know, you're relying on them, they're relying on you, and there's a reason for that. Peacetime, yes, you're, you're relying on everybody, you know, same thing, to get the job done, but it's not as close a bond as it is when you serve, you know, with 1st Battalion, 25th Marines, or 1st Battalion, 4th, or whatever or even if you're with the Irwin at Da Nang or something, you know, or, or what they're doing now. You're taking reserves and putting them into Iraq as a unit. So those guys are, now they're forming closer bonds than they would than just seeing each other once a month, one weekend a month, two weeks during the year. So it's a lot different. So yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna form closer bonds that way than you are if it's just, you know, the one weekend. Uh, in my case, uh, the last reserve unit I was with out is out of Rock Island, uh, the arsenal up there. Well, a lot of those folks come from the middle part of Illinois to Indiana and what have you. So it's hard to keep, you know, you, you may want to try to keep in touch, but everybody has their own jobs, their own lives, and everything, you know, filters out. So it's not, you have a little bit difference when it's the peacetime than it is when you're under actual fighting. After your service, did you uh, join a veterans organization? Yes. Uh, actually, even being in the reserves, um, when I moved back to Glenview from uh, Boston, and well, I, I was get out, get out for the first tour it was in '74. Got a job in Boston. I was out there for uh, three years, and uh, got a, got an opening here in Glenview at the post office. So I so I came back and I transferred from the reserve unit out in Boston to the reserves out at NES Glenview. So. Basically came back home, and uh, knew new folks that were in the American Legion, so I joined the Mar American Legion post here in Glenview. Um, Eighty-five, I was uh, asked by uh, Fourth Marine Headquarters to go back on active duty for three years as a full-time support uh, reserve active duty. So. Uh, 
I took a leave of absence from the post office, went and I was stationed out in South Weymouth, Massachusetts, so I went why not back out to Boston again for three years. That position, uh, they determined that they wanted to change again, so I ended up, uh, because of changes in the Marine Corps, I couldn't come back to Glen View because they had changed the buildings of the jobs that we had. I had promoted myself out of the job. So when I came back here to go back to the post office, I had to uh, find another reserve job if I wanted to be able to retire. So that's when I uh, found what they called a mobile training unit, which met out at the uh, uh, recruiting headquarters over in Des Plaines. And you got points, but you didn't get paid. And that's always nice, but you know, you like money every once in a while like to you know, go along with it. So I, I found, went back to uh, prior service recruiters and they found out that there was a reserve, reserve unit at uh, Rock Island that was not uh, uh, infantry related because we did have infantry down at 224 out of, out of Chicago. But since I was in motor transport slash engineers, they like to keep you in the same MOS, which is Military Occupational Specialty. So they had the opening out at uh, Rock Island, so that's where I went. I spent uh, my last five years there until I broke my kneecap. And uh, coming off of a broken kneecap and trying to get back into the swing of things is a little bit hard. And so, uh, I had, uh, had the time, and because of, of things happening where I, where I could not be 100% with uh, physically fit, um, I felt it was better to retire than to lose the retirement by being asked to leave for failure to be physically fit. Uh, you When you moved back to Glenview after the service, did you see many differences between Glenview before and Glenview after your service? Oh yeah, well, you have to remember, it, when, you, when you go out in the 70s, the mindset was, you know, you had 69, you had the, the peace movements, you had uh, the flower power, shall we say, all the way up until 75, 76, and in 75 is when we actually got out of Vietnam. That was when it was over. Uh, but you still had attitudes and the way people were as far as military was. And whether it was, you know, uh, you had some folks that joined the reserve program so that they didn't have to go to, to combat, you know, to go active duty. Um, which I had, uh, when I came back to Glenview, the, uh, the squadron that I belonged to uh, had the last remnants of the folks that joined the reserves so that they didn't have to go to Vietnam and they could wear short haired wigs and, and keep their long hair. So you had that. You had uh, race, race relations between black and white and brown throughout the 70s. Of, and, and the military is just like the civilian populace, only it's more regimented, but you still had, uh, you know, race, you had to go through race relations classes so you could deal with each other because you just had the stereotypes. And even, even being in civilian life, you had that. So, I mean, it's the same, you know, it's the same thing. See, yeah, there were, there were differences. And you get to see the differences of the town and how it changed over the years. I mean, you look at you know, Glenview Road and how it changes over the years and what buildings were there and what buildings aren't there. I mean, you, you go into the history of the town. And I've always been involved or been uh, very active in history and, uh, and of Glenview. So even though I don't live in Glenview anymore, and I basically, just recently retired from the post office in Glenview. I've spent my adult life 
working here, though I don't live here, but then being a, an American Legion, I do a lot of things for the holidays and what have you here. So it's like a second home. You uh, served during the Vietnam War and then you were in the reserve during the uh, Desert Storm era. Were right. there any differences in how those two uh, operations were carried out? Did you see any major differences from your point of view while you were in the either in active reserve or in uh, well, active combat or in the reserve? Not, not really because uh, when, when Desert Storm started, or the Desert Shield started, uh, the unit uh, I was with out at, out at Rock Island as a general support maintenance unit, we, uh, we were composite. We did uh, maintenance for uh, artillery, tanks, Amtrax, motor transport, opticals. So we did a little bit of everything. Um, the battalion was, was also made up of individual companies that did the same thing that we did. But they were sending people to get ready for Desert Shield. Uh, before Desert Storm started, we were put on uh, notice that we were going to be activated, which meant that you had to get your will, all your family, you know, things taken care of. I had to go ahead and uh, and get all my paperwork at work so that I, I was expected to, on such and such a date, I was supposed to call in and we were supposed to leave the next morning. Well, so basically I took a, a week's leave from work and term, put in my paperwork to terminate or go on leave of absence for the duration of the time I'd be gone. Well, as everybody knows, it was a hundred hour war. And when we called in, they said, no, you're not going because it's over already. So all of the guys, that, all of the folks in, in my company that, uh, like me, that had put in our paperwork to uh, basically leave work, had to go back to work again and say, oh, by the way, I'm not going. The guys that were in college had to wait another semester or another quarter before they could go back because the school had already the schools had already started. They couldn't go back to school, so they had to miss that that time because of the fact that okay, you're leaving, but now you're not leaving. So there's a letdown there. Of, well, why them, not us? And why not take us? And you're getting all this gear back. Let us at least go on and do our jobs for a while, you know, because everybody's done this commitment now it's so yeah it's you know you, you're on readiness you're all set you your mindset to go and then now you're not so it's just like when we did only when I was inactive you yeah okay fine well okay take the breath and now you're back to doing the same job again but it's now you're going back to civilian everybody's looking at you going weren't you supposed to be going somewhere or you know community band had to say, well, goodbye to everybody, and then the next week you come back to practice. And, well, we're not going. Oh, I don't know. But, and I uh, lost a friend. That was my next door neighbor when I was out in Weymouth. Uh, he was the last fatality for Desert Shield. Two, uh, two helicopters collided over the Arabian Sea, and Ken was the crew chief for one of those helicopters. He was a resident of Glenview, so I've known his folks for a long time. But he was so he would he would have told me uh, a combat because you know people that are close to you and you lose them. It still affects you. Uh. How did your service or experiences uh, affect either your view of the military view of the war and how did it affect your life post-service? Which war? <laughs> so, war <laughs> yeah, I guess no, military no, no, campaigns no. Well, in you general. Have to, you have to look at 
when you make the commitment to spend 20 plus years of your life in uniform, um, you're working for the government, you're working for that president. Makes no difference what policies he sets, you're still affected by it, by whatever Congress dictates. So no matter what, whether you think it's right, wrong, or indifferent, you have, because you're in uniform, you are going to serve those policies. Was Vietnam right? Um, yes and no. You know, uh, the initial idea of stopping communism was the forefront of everything, you know. Uh, that's why Eisenhower sent the advisors in. That's why Kennedy kept advisors there. The thing that you realize when you're in the military is that you have to look at what you're up against. And you have to know the mindset of those people that you're dealing with. If you look at the Oriental mind, it is a complete opposite of what Europeans or even the Americans feel. As Ho Chi Minh stated, as long as we drag this out, the American people will get tired of it. American people want things to be done yesterday. When you live in Okinawa for a year, when you deal with the Orientals, it's not, I started, I'll start a project today. If that project doesn't get done in my lifetime, that's okay, because my son will take over for me. So it will get done. It's just, it doesn't have to be today or tomorrow, but it will be, it'll be done. It's not... Oh, it has to be, you know, otherwise are you missing something? And that's the whole difference there. And as long as you draw a line and say you cannot go past the 30s, 36 parallel like we did in Korea, or you can't go past this line in Vietnam, you're not going to win. It's a draw. Or as some people say, well, you lost. Well, you can't fight a battle or a war if you're not given the opportunity to do what's necessary. And politics is always kind of playing to that. Just as it is through Desert Storm, Desert Shield. Uh, the good, good part about Desert Storm was that they gave Colin Powell carte blanche and said, this is what we want you to do, do it. They didn't draw a line and say, okay, you have to stop here. So he did. And they, they did all the objectives. Now, you go back and we had no-fly zones. We had uh, basically the Hussein government bottled up. Uh, then you change politics. And you turn around and say, well, is this what we want? It's just what that president decides he wants to do, you're going to do whatever that, you know. So whether you like it or not, if you don't like it, when, you're, when your tour is up, you can always leave. Or if you want to stay in, then, you know, this is what you have to realize. This is what's going to happen. So, but, uh, yeah, military and politics never, never mix. And... Uh, you have, to, you have to go back and the old adage is you have to learn from your mistakes. We're still only, what, what, the Marine Corps was 234 years in November. The country is only 230, 240 years old, basically, so we're still youngsters. We're still learning. Uh, we haven't had to go through all of the turmoil that Europe did. Or we've only had basically one invasion, if you will, and that was World War 1812, you know, 
so we've had one civil war. And if you take a look at how many times England's had a civil war in their history, or you know, so I mean, you know, we're, supposed, we're still learning. But we just, the technology has advanced us so much that it put us on the world stage. And we can thank Teddy Roosevelt for that and the Spanish-American War. So as I said, I'm a, I'm a military history nut, so, and a lot of us are. That's so you, you try to learn from that, but uh, and the experiences of being able to do something for the greater good is there. Well, okay, so why do it? Well, thank you, Mr. Carly. Okay. Is your receiver? Yeah. <laughs>